I want to start out this morning by uh, asking each one of you to think about a place or the best place where your best came to you. And I'll bet you I can name at least one of them. And that's the bathroom. It's either in the shower or you know. Well, while I was showering the other day and I was thinking about this sermon for today, and after reading an article written by uh, Michael Skinner, who is a human rights and peace activist, it occurred to me that although it's really disturbing, in today's gospel, Jesus explains where evil comes from. And he indicates it only comes from within all those people who bug you, but also from within us in ourselves. It takes a while for Jesus to get to that basic point in his exchange with a group of the Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem. It begins with the question about tradition, particular interpretations of the law given from Moses. Now this holds true for many of today's religions. Interpretations and traditions by us as humans is the root cause of our world problems today. If every Bible and every Quran were easily understood, maybe some of the hatred, the fighting, the senseless killing would not occur as it has in the past or even today. More so today, actually. Just like the Quran, Jesus' parables throughout the Gospels are so open to different interpretations that even Christian scholars can't agree to what he means. So should we expect differently from others that we encounter? Not even all of Jesus' followers, Jews, all of them, adhered to the same purity practices. Some of Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands in a particular way before eating. The fact that they didn't wash their hands meant very little, as the wider Jewish population at that time didn't exhibit strict consistencies in such matters. Yet the scribes and the Pharisees questioned and implicitly criticized the disciples. One may ask why all of Jesus' followers don't abide by this more recent custom. What kind of teacher leads his pupils to violate the revered practices of the elders' teachings, that is, the legal interpretations affirmed by those scribes and Pharisees? Jesus cites the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of Isaiah 29. He thus likens the tradition of elders as more human precepts that misconstrue God's commandments. And while I was writing this and, and, uh, and I wrote the road commandments, a little humor crept in there, and I want to share it with you. There was a Sunday school teacher who was discussing the Ten Commandments with her five and six-year-old children. After explaining the commandments to honor thy father and thy mother, she said, is there a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters. Well, one little boy quickly jumped up and didn't skip a beat, and he said, Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> now, in no way does Jesus deny the validity of either the Mosaic law in general or its individual commandments. Jesus criticized them not because they believed that by obeying these sanitary practices and were being faithful to the law of Moses and elders, but they excluded others and setting themselves up as elitists. This in itself was a violation of God's will, according to Jesus. The reference to Isaiah 29 also allows Jesus to redirect the conversation when settings change later. In verse 14, the Isaiah passage introduces a contrast between the lips, mouth, and heart. And Jesus builds on this contrast to transform the issue into one about defilement. Simply put, impurity is a matter of the heart. It's about the action or attitude. Now that, now what or how one eats. The, passenger, the passage ends with a representative list of things capable of making people impure. Some are deeds, others are character traits and attitudes. All originate, Jesus says, in the human heart which for the ancients represented the seat of rationality and will. Defilement dwells deep within. Now what Jesus didn't say, there is no proof that Jesus himself disregarded the dietary laws. 
In any case, the parabolic nature of Jesus' comments in verse 17 supports the conclusion that hand washing and foods are not the main concern here. Instead, today's gospel makes, speaks much more plainly about the source of defilement. It's more internal than external. Jesus was asking which means more to God, obedience, which his disciples are being accused of not doing, or a contradiction, such as washing your hands, than turning around and despising your brothers and sisters. It's more about who you are than about the foods or filth you avoid. To be clear, Jesus does not ish dismiss the issue of defilement as insignificant. He does not declare the Mosaic law unimportant. Jesus disagrees with these scribes and Pharisees interpretations of certain laws. Jesus reasserts the law's basic concern to be about remaining evil and avoiding defilement. Yet here's the problem for us human beings. Evil and defilement stem from places rather deeply embedded within our very selves. To that I offer four comments. The first one is Jesus' outlook on human heart needs careful qualifications. For example, he does not denounce the heart for producing only evil intentions. Now I believe some people are still just evil, if you must, but I still think it's worth understanding that even the people we believe to be the most evil or the least caring occasionally are capable of some great good and selfless compassion. <clears throat> Secondly, remember it's not the scribes, not the Pharisees, not the law that Jesus subjects his fiercest criticisms in this passage but is us, the human being. Jesus is saying the basic problem Christians should be concerned about is not how or what one should eat, but the internal corruption of us as human beings. It is this malignancy that chokes the life out of tradition, turns it into an enemy of God, contorts it into a way of excusing injustice, and blinds those afflicted by it to the point of their own culpability for evils that trouble this world today. This is whether we realize it or not, the same self-justification the Pharisees were very good at. The third thing is Jesus' comments propel us to keep our, evil, our evils in the spotlight. Whatever Satan is in Mark's gospel, it is not the cause of wrongdoing. The job belongs to the human heart. Placing blame on some entity lurking in the shadows risks diverting attention from our own propensity to rebel and destroy. Truly evil intentions dwell not only within society's notorious figures, but within ourselves and those we love and trust the most. We know enough about human condition to say that evil is about more than an individual's selfishness or bad decisions. It roams our very existence, our social, economic, and religious beliefs today. We are at once perpetrators and victims. For example, our kin and culture usually keeps us ingrained in patterns of defiling self-destructiveness and idolatry. And our victimization furthers our capability, capacity to perpetrate. It doesn't matter what nationality, color, creed, religion, or sexual orientation one is. Because of our human nature, at one time or another, we have all thought disparagingly about someone else. And yet, at the same time, we suggest we are, we are victims because someone else has thought disparagingly of us. The human heart or the human will still remains a complex thing. Lastly, and most important of all, we, as the children of God, must exhibit God's love and mercy whenever opportunity arises. We need to share the good news of Jesus Christ that we are not going to allow our traditions, practices, or ingrained thoughts created by our experiences dictate our faithfulness to God. Not only us as Christians, but all the others in the world must do this in order for this world to be a better place to live and pleasing to God, Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, or whomever one answers to. Someone needs to start, <clears throat> so what do you say? Let's all go out there today 
and begin to share God's love and mercy in the way Jesus intended it to be. To each and every broken human being we encounter, no matter what our belief or religion. Amen.